Yes, iron overload could be wrecking havoc on your body without you even realizing it. Can cause fatigue, joint pain, blood sugar issues like diabetes, and even problems with your heart and liver. And iron overload is actually more common than most people think. And while iron overload and hemochromatosis aren't necessarily hard to treat and diagnose, there are some missteps that one can take that I want to make you aware of. So in this video, we'll walk through exactly what I do when I'm suspecting that one of my patients has hemochromatosis or iron overload. My name is Dr. Taranella and in this channel we're dedicated to helping you improve and optimize your health. We draw on my over 15 years of clinical experience and usually pull in some research as well. So if you're getting a lot out of these videos and want to continue getting videos like this, click on that like and subscribe button to continue getting videos like this. All right, let's jump into the video and break down some of the key steps to diagnosing and treating iron overload. Okay, so step one in dealing with iron overload is you want to understand the complexity of the diagnosis and you want to first confirm that what you think you have going on is actually going on. And diagnosing the source of your iron overload isn't always straightforward as there are various conditions that can mimic the other conditions. Now, oftentimes when you have iron overload going on, the first thing that you're going to think about or want to rule out is do you have hemochromatosis? This is the most common reason to have iron overload load and I'm going to lay that out for you. And usually if someone is wondering about having iron overload or what the cause is, that's because they've already gotten some blood tests done. And one of the blood tests that you may find as high is your ferritin or your serum iron or maybe even your iron saturation. These are all common tests that are going to make us potentially think we might have too much iron or iron overload. And so an elevated level on any three of those would be presumptive for iron overload for sure. Another reason people might be wondering about this is maybe they have a family member with diagnosis of hemochromatosis and so they want to understand what to look for and things like that. And so what you want to be looking for on your blood test is something known as the iron saturation. And if your iron saturation is elevated, it means that at the present moment, there's not enough of the transferrin floating around that can bind up your iron, which is makes it more safe for your body. And typically in cases of hemochromatosis, that iron saturation is going to start creeping up close to and outside of the normal range there, which is 46 and higher. And so if you have have that it's definitely suspicious for hemochromatosis. Usually what I have patients do is go back and test it again and try not to have as much red meat and specific iron supplements close to the test. That's going to give us a little more certainty that this is or is not a hemochromatosis picture. If it's still high, that's more strongly suggests that. If it drops down for whatever reason, maybe you're eating tons of red meat, you may that may not be an issue. And over time, you just follow it. Eventually, if things are looking more and more like that's not the issue because the iron saturation never went back up or yes there that is the issue and the ferritin is also going up well in that case it may make sense to get the genetic test done so it really just depends on that teeter-totter between like how obvious it is and how obvious isn't it a lot of times insurance will pay for this genetic test so if you have the right lab metrics it would be and typically covered but every insurance is different and you usually have to go through some kind of prior authorization as well so the genetics can certainly be helpful in letting you know how how careful you should be with your red meat intake and what that susceptibility is and also what you might be passing on to your children. But it's also important to note that you can also have genetic problems with your iron absorption, like in the case of hemochromatosis, but your iron levels actually are normal. You can also have iron overload, states that suggest you might have hemochromatosis or some other condition, but who don't actually have that, you have something else going on. And something like that may show up in the case of maybe you have inflammation, which is driving your ferritin up. In those cases, typically the iron saturation is still going to be within the normal range. So that's how you differentiate that. And so in that case, it's not likely to persist once the reason that, you, you know, say you were sick for a month, that's going to drive the ferritin up. But once you remove that infectious thing or whatever is driving the ferritin up, then you start to see that normalize. Whereas if you have hemochromatosis, those elevated iron levels are going to be more persistent. Even if you're trying to lower your iron intake, 
they're going to always be riding that upper end. And there are different genetics, specific genetics for hemochromatosis, which is going to ultimately drive how careful you want to be with your iron intake if you end up do testing positive. So the C282Y is going to cause more severe hemochromatosis, generally speaking, and the H63D typically doesn't lead to as much percentage-wise to hemochromatosis. And so that tells me if you have more of a C282Y, you're going to have to put a lot more effort into avoiding those high iron foods. And that's another reason why knowing your genetics can be really useful if this is an ongoing problem. So now that we have a little more clarity on what type of iron overload or hemochromatosis you might have, now I want to move on to what are we actually going to do? And there are five, maybe six different kind of buckets of things you're going to want to be doing to monitor and keep up when you do have hemochromatosis. The first one most commonly is to do phlebotomy. The phlebotomy is going to drop your ferritin and iron saturation pretty quickly. And depending on how high your ferritin is and how saturated your iron is, is going to basically lay out for us how much blood donation you want to do. I like to keep a really close eye on all of those numbers between each donation so I can monitor what's happening. A more standard way to approach this is just have the person go donate blood once a week for four to six weeks and then recheck them after that. The other thing we need to be more careful and more diligent with is our diet. We need to look at and assess the things that we're eating and find alternatives that are going to have less iron in them. We also want to make sure we're not inadvertently increasing the iron absorption even further by taking things like vitamin C. The other thing is we want to be mindful of of inflammation. Inflammation, again, is going to drive up your ferritin level. So we want to be monitoring that inflammation and also having high iron is going to drive up inflammation. So we want to be monitoring both of those back and forth unless it's already normal. In that case, we don't need to monitor it. But other things that can also be affected by having high iron levels, things like testosterone, pituitary hormones, even insulin production in the pancreas could be linked with high iron levels. And after your levels of iron and iron saturation get back into normal, depending on what your goals are, you may not need to stay on it. More than likely, you're going to need to have ongoing monitoring, maybe every three months to every six months to make sure that ferritin level and iron saturation aren't starting to go up again. The other thing in terms of targeting your ferritin and iron saturation levels, if you have hemochromatosis or some other iron overload situation, is it is going to be a little bit individualized in terms of what you're going to tolerate on your your ferritin and iron saturation. And that's on both ends too. I mean, some people may feel more weak and fatigued with lower iron and some people with lower ferritin levels and some people may start to feel pain and problems from too high of iron but I'll give you some general ranges to think about. For both males and females, you're probably going to want to be south of 100 on the top end. And on the low end, I would say around 30 to 50. And that's all for your ferritin. On the iron saturation, that's the one that you want to definitely keep within the normal range. So it's going to be, for some people, a compromise between how low they can get the iron saturation while keeping that ferritin level within reasonable ranges as well. And then on top of that, the bigger thing you have to watch out for is your actually anemic and things like that. And so sometimes it's a delicate balance between making sure you have enough red blood cells, making sure your ferritin is low enough and your iron saturation is low enough. So the first priority is bringing this down. As you do that, these things may get thrown off as well. And so that's why I prefer to have more frequent follow-up so that you don't run into problems and have to correct that later. Another thing we should mention is that when the phlebotomies aren't enough due to whatever reason, maybe the person just is a hyperabsorber of iron or there's some complication to an end organ and want to speed up the process, there are iron chelators that one could take for this, but it's not something that I've ever used before. Hopefully this video was helpful in giving you a better understanding of what I do in patients with iron overload. And if you wanted to drill into any of these topics, some of the different tangents on genetics or, or lab metrics, etc., there's a playlist on iron and iron overload that you might want to check out. If you do have any other questions about this topic or things related to iron overload, drop them in the comment section. Happy to answer your question. If you want a more customized, detailed answer to your question, consider joining the membership program where I'll have more time and attention to dedicate to your question. Now, one question you might have after watching this video is, what are the causes of high iron saturation? And you can find a full video on that topic right here.